Um, I picked a topic this morning on innovation ecosystems. And the reason for this is increasingly the nature of competition is changing in technology businesses. And this change has been referred to as many things. Some people call it platform competition. Some people call it ecosystem competition. But the idea is it's not my company competing against your company. It is my ecosystem of partners competing with your ecosystem of partners. So we could talk about the iOS platform versus the Android platform, or we could talk about the Tesla platform versus the Nissan platform very different infrastructure and requirements for the whole constellation of partners. And I thought that uh, for you all today, thinking about what your own business strategy is in terms of your own investments in technology, your own investments in marketing, and then thinking about how you build your ecosystem of partners is critically important. So let's just take a look here at a familiar ecosystem that all of us are aware of, which is Apple. We frequently think about who our suppliers are, and we frequently think about what our distribution channel is. But we also have to think in terms of the customer usage experience, which are what are the apps they want to use, what is the nature of the wireless broadband available to them, how are the Apple products integrated into things such as cars, smart homes, other devices that we might be using? And if we want to listen to music, how do we actually access the particular songs we want? As we know, there are many artists such as Taylor Swift who said, I don't want my products available on the ecosystem because I'm not appropriately compensated. And so this idea of looking at how the users want to use your product in conjunction with this broader constellation of partners has big implications for success in high-tech markets. Now I'm going to ask you a question. When you think about how affiliate revenue works, affiliate revenue is when a company like Amazon or Apple compensates other companies for referring traffic to their business. So in the case of Amazon, if a website refers traffic to Amazon to purchase products there, the referring website gets a commission on those sales. Same for Apple. When different companies refer people to iTunes in particular, which I know is being disrupted by the streaming music movement, but a lot of people still do own their music on their devices, who is the number one affiliate revenue earner for Apple iTunes? It's Starbucks, OK? So this idea of looking at your ecosystem is really important. And I think we can think creatively about that. All right, so let's start with some terminology. I know in this country, you've worked very hard to build your entrepreneurial ecosystem. And when we talk about ecosystems, I'm talking about something a little bit different. So this definition comes from a Harvard Business Review article by Ron Adner. He also has a book on innovation ecosystems. So if you find some of this information interesting this morning, I would encourage you to look at his article. He essentially defines an ecosystem as the collaborative arrangements through which firms combine individual offerings into a customer-facing solution. And this notion of customer facing is critical because we need to always think in terms of how the customers want to use the products. This is sometimes called an innovation network, and it's sometimes called a collaboration network. It is different than what we talk about in terms of strategic alliances, however, and I'm going to come to some of those implications shortly. Of course, the word ecosystems was originated in the biology literature. And when we think about a biological ecosystem, we think about organisms that mutually depend on each other for survival. And this idea is sometimes called symbiosis, and it captures the notion of interdependencies. Interdependencies can occur between living organisms, such as you know, the birds and the things they eat, and the trees and the nuts and the atmosphere and the water. But it could also refer to non-living organisms, such as the soil that they, the plants depend on to grow, and other things such as the wind. 
And so when we look at the biological ecosystem, we get this idea of flows between organisms and flows that are circular and somewhat reciprocal. Okay, so then we take this notion to the business ecosystem. The business ecosystem is much broader than the supply chain. And what we see is it can include complementary products, and it can also include after-sales service, which is a critical component of any product usage experience, especially when we think like customers and we need to consider if they have problems using the product. And this idea of products and services that are vital to the customer experience. And I'll come to some examples of this shortly when we talk about some of the local companies that I've worked with, such as Plan C Ball. All right, so what we see here is this extended notion. And this comes from a book at the bottom. If you look here, I don't want to um, hit the wrong button. I'm not sure how to use the, the pointer. It comes from a book called The Death of Competition, Leadership and Strategy in the Age of Business Ecosystems. And the idea is, is that rather than thinking about my company versus your company, again, we think about my ecosystem versus your ecosystem. <clears throat> All right, so let's clarify what this is compared to other ecosystems. What we know is uh, when we look at what's happening here with Ingenio and Ani and Latu, what we see is that there's this very big focus on developing all the elements that we need for our business to succeed, which would be venture capital, intellectual property, training, mentoring, smart students out of smart programs at the university. I'm not talking about that today, okay, just to clarify. And then in the United States, we have quite a bit of investment through the National Science Foundation to build our innovation ecosystem compared to other countries at a national level. And this is sometimes referred to as an innovation ecosystem as well. But again, I want to clarify that that is not what I'm talking about either. And so I've mentioned this book, The Death of Competition. We also have looked at a book um, on a research project that I'm doing on ecosystems called The Keystone Advantage. And the idea of a keystone player is somebody, a company, or an organism who is the top of their ecosystem. And their decisions essentially affect a whole network of players. So keystone species might be something like giraffes in the African savanna that eat the acacia trees, which are so critical to the way the rest of the savanna ecosystem plays out. And we might think of Google or Apple, of course, as a keystone member in their ecosystems. Um, I would argue that even companies like Nike, the footwear company, who is increasingly moving their business to a database business to collect data from athletes on their workouts to help them improve their fitness, I would argue that companies like Nike increasingly are not going to be product companies, but they're going to become ecosystem companies as well. So I think not only thinking about your business today, but how your business will evolve in the future based on this concept is critically important. All right, so from my perspective, this notion of a business ecosystem is not necessarily all that new. It's been around since the 1990s. But what makes it particularly interesting today is when we put the word innovation in front of the word ecosystem, innovation means new technologies, new products, things that customers are not familiar with, ecosystem players that perhaps are not established and we don't know how to establish what we're going to need. And so this idea of an innovation ecosystem makes it very uh, it makes it very logical to tie with what we've done in my classes here in terms of marketing of technology and innovation, where we talk about marketing for my individual company. Now we're going to broaden that perspective and talk about how do we broaden that for the ecosystem. And I know that we've learned a lot of concepts about interdependency and trust and communication in our strategic alliances. But I want to take it a level beyond these interpersonal dynamics in terms of how do you do a risk assessment of your <coughs> ecosystem so that when you're gauging your own technical risk and market risk, you have an idea of ecosystem risk as well. OK, does that make sense? All right, so we have to build this from the ground up when we come into a new technology. And this is more complicated than business as usual. Now, I've heard that you had Philip Kotler come and speak to you, and he talked about value chain competition compared to value chain competition. And this, again, is an extension of that idea. All right, I want to keep in mind that as good marketing 
companies, because we all know that technical companies need a marketing proficiency, you always have to take the customer perspective in everything we do. So an ecosystem from the customer's perspective essentially are all the elements a customer is going to need in order to benefit from my product specifically. So if we're talking about something like the Internet of Things, we know that any business that's going to wire up their uh, containers in the port, they're going to have to have not only the sensors, but they're going to have to have a way to collect and download the data, store the data, have meaningful software to analyze the data, and I think that's the most important thing from a customer's perspective, and then to share the data in terms of what are the implications for my business strategy. And as we build out more and more of these capabilities, the fact is we don't have standards or protocols for good data sharing across these different platforms that are evolving to wire up the sensors. Salesforce.com, which is a company that we know in the CRM arena, is moving into helping their customers wire their businesses through the Internet of Things. And we know CRM on Salesforce has always been a platform that isn't necessarily plug and play with other platforms. So I think if we're going to think like customers as technology providers, we have to think about what our customers are going to want long term because otherwise they're going to be very risk averse because they don't want to get locked in too early as these technologies develop. And so when we translate that customer perspective to the firm perspective, I'm asking you to consider the constellation of partners that you need to service your customers well. And two very recent books, in fact, this book, The Platform Revolution, my husband told me just arrived at my home in Missoula yesterday because it was just released on Amazon, which I don't think that this publisher withheld their book from Amazon the way we know other publishers have because of the same issues about is the platform treating them fairly. And this other one, how Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google have redefined business, it's based on the age of the platform. So in terms of keeping up with these trends, I think that this is definitely one that we need to be looking at in the future. All right, so I've picked a visual here to depict this notion of platform competition. And the idea is platforms are based on rules for interoperability. And this is the language of engineering. And so we all understand that we need plug and play standards or a common interface if we're going to have <coughs> something that's easy for customers to use. And then we know we might have one proprietary platform competing with another proprietary platform. So the symbol here essentially are the two different plugs that are used for electric vehicles. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but as the United States has built out its electric vehicle infrastructure, consumers want to be able to charge their electric vehicles at any charging station. But there aren't two plug types, there are actually three plug types. So Tesla has its proprietary network of superchargers and I should have pulled this up. It is amazing to see the very rural locations that Tesla has built superchargers. Now, many of you know I'm from the third largest state in the United States, which is Montana. And we have fewer than one million people in the whole state. Yet we have three Tesla superchargers across the highway, Interstate 90. And to my knowledge, we have only one Tesla in the whole state. But the idea is Tesla knows that to have the love of the road and the love of driving that motivates a Tesla owner, they might one day want to drive from Seattle to Boston, in which case they will go through Montana. And so they need those three chargers every 300 miles across the state. Then there is the Nissan charging network, which is on the Chatamo standard, which was, of course, developed in Japan. And what Japan has done as a country is they have invested every 10 kilometers, they have one charger. I, let me rephrase that. They have a charging station. And the number of chargers at that station is a function of the population density going by that area. Now, that sounds really good because we know that Japan has been very progressive in terms of planning through its Ministry of Trade and Economy. 
But the problem is, once you want to swipe at a network, there are two different swiping networks. And so it could be that your card doesn't work at a particular network, even if you have the right plug. And then in the United States, of course, we do everything our own way. And we have the SAE 1772 plug, which was named by an engineer, of course. <laughs> And it works for Volts and uh, other Chevy products. But there aren't very many of those anywhere, right? Although the head of the, the cover article on Wired Magazine in November said that Mary Barra at GM, with her introduction of the Bolt, which is the next generation of the Volt, it's the other B in Spanish, Bolt, not Volt. <laughs> It's taken me a long time to understand the other V. Um, and um, Wired Magazine says that GM is going to overtake Tesla in this industry, which I think is a pretty bold statement for Wired to make. So I'm wondering who GM's PR person was that got that coup. I mean, that was a coup. OK, so this captures that notion of platform competition in a really tangible way. But I know that this notion translates into the software industry quite well. So if you've taken my class, you know that we've learned Jeffrey Moore. And we know that we need these development of industry standards in order to cross the chasm so that our customers don't experience fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so this is nothing new. And you might say, yes, we already know this. But what is new here is something that I think is important. Your own investments in your own research and development and your own technologies is insufficient for your own market success. And so this is where those notions of interdependencies arrive. And the fact is, if the other elements of your infrastructure are not ready to hit the market at the same time as your inventions, you will not be successful. So as I was talking about this with Raphael this weekend, um, I had a very lovely trip to Colonia, which was my first time to Colonia, I'm embarrassed to say, after having been here five times. But it was fabulous. And talking about this in the car, because technology engineers and marketers only talk about work all the time. Is this true? <laughs> yeah. Um, he said that there was this really brilliant software program that Ingenio incubated in around 2009, 2010, if I recall correctly. And it was called Touch IT. And he said the software was brilliant to automate restaurant service. But one of the key components of the solution was the hardware. And the hardware at that time, 2009, 2010, we didn't have tablets yet. We were very early in the smartphone market. And so the hardware was somewhat bulky. It was expensive. It was a little bit clunky. And so in this particular case, Raphael's experience was that it was the other elements of this innovation ecosystem that inhibited this company's success, even though the company's software was brilliant. And so this idea of if your partners aren't ready, your own first mover advantage doesn't matter is a really important conclusion. And we're going to talk about what does this mean in a minute in terms of your own strategy and your own investment. OK, so that's timing risk relative to your ecosystem. Then we have interdependence risk. OK, so I'm basing these three types of risk on the Ron Adner reading. Interdependence risk essentially is, have you done your own due diligence on your partner's capabilities? So this isn't, do they trust you? Have you established good terms? It's, have you done your own due diligence on their technical capabilities? Regulatory issues they might face. In the United States, one of the biggest issues in the big data movement in healthcare is regulation. And it is the insurance industry, which is regulated now with Obamacare, or what we like to call the Affordable Care Act, which we're still behind the rest of the world in healthcare insurance. I do know this. Um, financial risk that your partners may incur. And do they have the right leadership? When, you, when venture capitalists investigate your own companies, these are the things that they're looking at. Have you done that for your partners? You have to do your own due diligence on your partners, because your interdependence with them means that you are not alone. And Ron, Ander, excuse me, Ron Adner believes that this interdependency risk is multiplicative. Okay, So I'm going to um, 
if you want to quantify this, which I know engineers like to do, I can actually quantify this as well. But I haven't gone to that level this morning. So what Ron Abner says is that if your own assessment of your partners is that they're not going to be ready when you would want them to be ready, it makes more sense for you to actually help invest in their technical development and not necessarily your own technical development your, or, or your own market development. So we might call this a joint venture. We might call this some sort of a strategic alliance. And we know that we can consider this. But when we're a startup on our own, it's hard for us to imagine how could we divert any of our resources to a partner. That's their own problem. But I'm telling you, no, it's not. It's your problem. And so this idea that Ron Adner comes up with is how do you somehow share R&D resources that, so that you're both ready to go to the market at the same time? And so when we look at what Plan Say Ball has done in terms of being the number one deployment in the world of one laptop per child, this effort to make sure not only that the hardware was available for the school kids, but also that there was content available and that the Wi-Fi or wireless or broadband deployment is widely deployed, that teachers are educated, that assessment standards are in place. It's a very important part of Plan Say Ball's success, and it's not just distributing the laptops. Um, I do have to say that over the five years that I've been here as well, I've noticed just exponential increases in the broadband capabilities over time. Um, and so it's been fun for me to see that, you know, when I come back, it's, you have this vision if it was a little baby. The baby never grows when you're gone, but you come back and you see that it has. And so it's been really wonderful to see how dynamic this ecosystem has been in some of these aspects. Okay, so I've done timing risk, interdependence risk, and now I'm going to do integration risk. Integration risk essentially looks directly at the vertical relationships on your supply chain. Your upstream suppliers, you as a company, and then any distributors that you might use. And essentially what this integration risk is, what is the buying cycle for your customers? How long does it take your customers to make a purchase decision? And it depends on who your customers are. If I'm an OEM, my customers are retailers. And depending on the business that I'm in, they may be on an annual buying cycle. So we sometimes go to trade shows. In the United States, we have the CES, which is looking at next year's holiday season electronics. So it's in January for the next year. So that's a year out. If we're talking about upstream suppliers and I want to make an autonomous vehicle and I'm looking at what chips do I want to use in the operating system for that, um, I am looking at a long development cycle, potentially a couple years to get it right. And so it's not a function of, is my own car ready? It's do I have the right chips? And those chips are going to take a long time. And then if I look at my end users, if my end users are a government entity, we know that bureaucracy slows down decision making. If that entity is an education, education system, we might be looking at two to three years in terms of an investment in our teacher training that we can't obsolete after one year. We have to make sure that we get two years, three years, four years, five years out of that. And so the implication for this is that integration risk is additive. So what you think is your own cycle of one year, when you look at your customers, you add a year. When you look at their customers, you're out a year. When you add these people, it's another year. And it's no wonder our success trajectory takes years. All right, this makes sense of that. And so one thing I loved about Ron Adner's work is he says, there aren't any bad numbers. Five years is not a bad length of time. There's only bad expectations. And if you believe you're going to be successful next year and you haven't looked at your integration risk, you've set an unreasonable expectation for you, your team, your partners, your <coughs> investors. Don't set bad expectations. Be smart about this. OK, so many of you know that last year I concluded a three-year term at the National Academies of Science in Washington, DC. And I wanted to tell you that um, on the report that we wrote, which is publicly available on the National Academy's website, we assessed technical risk of batteries. We assessed um, the automaker's risk of building the cars. And uh, it's probably no surprise that I did chapter three, which was on the ecosystem risk from the customer's perspective. Then we had utilities risk in terms of the electricity grid and problems there. 
And then we also had business model risk in terms of car sharing, Zipcar, and all of the innovations that are coming that are going to result in people not even owning their own vehicles. We did not have a chapter on autonomous vehicles because three years ago, they were still a dream. We're, we're getting so close to that now, it's truly remarkable. And so when you look at this picture, I'm not going to go through each element here, but I could. The customer essentially doesn't know that they want an electric vehicle because they have too many questions about charging infrastructure. The dealer who sells the car doesn't want to sell the car because the salesperson takes three times as long to sell an electric vehicle as a traditional internal combustion engine, but they are not compensated three times as much. Moreover, the dealers themselves don't know what they don't know, and the dealer's investment in training a salesperson oftentimes walks out the door when that salesperson leaves, and there's a high degree of turnover or churn in this industry. The automakers themselves are losing money on every car that they sell that is an electric vehicle car. The president of Fiat has gone on record saying, please don't buy my electric vehicles. I don't know if you remember this. Um, Tesla is only profitable because they are selling the emission credits in the state of California they get from having zero emissions. Every automaker in California has to meet zero emission targets. Most of them are not making it, so they essentially buy Tesla's credits, and that's how they're achieving the regulatory standards. It's the only reason Tesla is profitable. So the automakers themselves have serious problems uh, that contributes to this ecosystem risk. I mentioned the whole idea of the charger dynamics, and that was only for public charging. We also have at-home charging. Um, I happen to be an early adopter of a Chevy Volt, and I didn't know for a whole year that I was at risk of a thermal incident in my garage where I charge. They never used the word fire. Um, the, the thermal incident was if I didn't have a dedicated plug for my electric vehicle, which fortunately, you know, we only have one thing in our garage. In the United States, at least in Montana, it's common to have an auxiliary freezer because we shoot animals in Montana and we eat them. It's sort of like you have cows here. We have cows in Montana too, but we do this natural hunting, and so many hunters have a freezer in their garage that they stock with their venison or their elk meat uh, that they have you know, harvested, which is a euphemism for killing. Um, and so we did have our freezer in our garage plugged into that. And I said to my husband, unplug it. We're going to have a thermal incident in our garage. <laughs> OK, so the whole idea is once we looked at this ecosystem risk, Obama's goal of having 1 million electric vehicles on US roadways by 2015 in 2012 when we started was a realistic goal, but it's less than a half a percent of the vehicles in the United States. It's a very modest goal. And when we look at what it means to have the adoption and diffusion of innovation, a half of a percent is not even through the technology enthusiast market. It hasn't even begun to hit the mainstream market. So this, this infrastructure risk, I think we're looking at 10 to 20 years to do anything reasonable. Now, in contrast, Norway has 12.5% penetration of electric vehicles in the country of Norway. And uh, I happened to speak uh, with the Secretary General of the EV Association in Norway last November when we shared a flat in Saudi Arabia where we were on a panel talking about the future of global transportation in a country where women can't drive. Um, it was quite interesting. And she said, essentially, they have purchased that adoption. They have given high, high subsidies. They have eliminated the VAT tax. They have formed user groups so that electric vehicle drivers get together, which we know this critical mass creates a tipping point. They have created uh, roadways that are electric vehicle roadways where customers can actually swipe to get bonuses for tourism along the way if they have an electric vehicle. They have a contest, a photo contest, for people in their electric vehicles to take pictures in the country of Norway when they're on vacation and post them on Instagram to develop this enthusiasm about being an electric vehicle owner. And when you think about uh, the population density and the excitement that they've generated through her association, she's brilliant. And she says, I don't think we did anything so special. And I said, you are very special. 
All right, so the implications here. You must plan for delays that are outside your control. And you have to have a strategy that mitigates this ecosystem risk. And then this is a very strong statement. Or you should forego the opportunity because it will be putting good money after bad. Okay, so that's a really strong statement. All right, so I just had a few examples here where I don't think that we've done a good enough job in future technology of mapping the ecosystem strategy. So if you were in my class this time around, uh, you know all the daily assignments you get to do during your week that you're with me. One of them now is to map the ecosystem strategy for some of these emerging technologies and to talk about interdependence risk and integration risk because I think it really changes the way we think about marketing investments. So you've seen this slide before from me. We know that success for your companies is a function of your technical skills and sophistication, which I have no doubt about that with the people in this room. Uh, it requires a well-developed marketing competency, which I am so grateful for the opportunity to be here and to help you develop this. But now you also need to develop this ecosystem competency, which takes us outside of our comfort zone even further. Okay, so as I looked at what was happening in the Uruguayan innovation ecosystem, these are just a few of the companies that um, I'm familiar with and that I've worked with over time. And I think it's really exciting to see what, what the future holds. And although I know that people say the Uruguayan economy is only 3 million people and we're a small country, you know, squeezed between these behemoths of Brazil and Argentina, but the fact is, I think that with the right strategy, the potential is very, very, very big. And I think that the vision that people have had here, for example, Marcel starting the MGET program here and building such a sophisticated curriculum, Rafael for all the work that he's doing at Ingenio, I know many of you know how brilliant he is, to Gaston Labadie, the dean here, for investing in kind of next generation engineering talent for marketing and commercialization. And to all of you, I think that um, my being here is as much a celebration of all of you as it is of inviting me to be here. And I just can't <laughs> wait to see what the next five years hold as I continue to come over time. This platform like, like, uh, like this one. Yeah, so I think it's interesting that when you look at the Genexus platform and the constellation of partners they have and the offices that they have, I think that from my perspective, and again, I'm, I'm outside the system, but from my perspective, sometimes these ecosystems evolve somewhat organically over time without this proactive plan strategy. But I also think that when we look at these big software companies, they have a software developer kit. They have conferences and trainings. They have different vertical niches that they help their partners go after strategically in terms of opportunities. They have excellent facilitation of the um, technical support that they need. And so I think that although some of this is logical, sometimes when we're at the outset before we get big, we don't think about what the possibility is. And so from my perspective, when I look at a uh, constellation of the ecosystem like Genexus, essentially their job, in my estimation, is to make sure that they stay on the cutting edge of technology so that they don't suffer from the innovator's dilemma because of all those sunk costs that their constellation of partners has made in this generation of technology. So I think that they've established a very strong, vibrant ecosystem, but the bigger risk now is how do they maintain that as technology standards change and we move into the Internet of Things and big data and other things that that platform was designed at a time when those weren't even on the horizon. So I think having some sort of a skunk works or some sort of a new venture group that allows them to maintain their innovation integrity for future generations, I think, is the bigger risk there. From, from my perspective, the idea of a platform means that we do have competing standards for interoperability. So that's one change. The other change is 
any business can have an ecosystem. So if I'm McDonald's, I have all my franchisees around the world and I have my upstream supply chain of where I get my cattle and I know that I need to have customer education in the United States about health issues because we're facing a lot of regulation about you know, obesity in the United States. But the fact is, it's not an innovation ecosystem because everybody knows how to go to McDonald's and order their food. And so from my perspective, there are three points of distinction from a business ecosystem. Business typically does not mean novelty to consumers, self-driving cars that we have some fear and doubt over, even though the data show preliminarily that self-driving cars reduce accidents by 90% because of human error in the driving process and distraction. Um, and so business compared to innovation is a big difference. And then you add on the possibility of platforms with these different standards for interoperability. I think those are the big differences, Rosario. Thank you very much for being here so early.